I'm Nancy Browse. I live in Putney, and we're both here today representing Safe and Green Campaign, which is a campaign of people who live within 20 miles of the Vermont nuclear reactor who want to see it closed safely and promptly. My name is Leslie Sullivan Sachs, <laughs> and I live in Brattleboro. In addition to the Safe and Green Campaign, I also work with the Sage Alliance which is a collective of anti-nuclear groups and affinity groups working to shut down Vermont Yankee. And we're here to talk about uh, this coming weekend's Fukushima anniversary events. Two years ago, on March 11th, the start of the disaster at Fukushima began, the beginning of the meltdown at the reactors of Fukushima Daiichi in Japan. And we were here because we're promoting a group of events that are going to commemorate and honor the people that have been affected by this and let people know in the local area how how close the parallels are between Vermont Yankee and the Fukushima nuclear power. About a month ago, Chiho Kaniko came to Brattleboro and gave a presentation, which you can watch on Brattleboro Community Access TV. Um, and we were very moved by her presentation. Not only did she talk about uh, the facts of the situation on the ground in Fukushima, but she also shared the stories of the people that she met when she went there. Chiho was raised in Japan. She's lived in the United States for the last uh, 15 years or so. And she's visited the Fukushima prefecture four times since March 2011. And she did this beautiful slideshow presentation. And it really uh, touched my heart and the hearts of the standing room only crowd who was there to hear her tell these individual stories. And that's when we started uh, reading and doing research on what happened to the people of the towns in the evacuation zone around the Fukushima Daiichi reactors. One of those reactors is the same as ours here in Vernon. It's uh, built by General Electric. Um, ours is just a year difference in age, and it's a boiling water reactor. And the only major difference is that in that reactor, the spent fuel pool in Vermont Yankee contains far more highly radioactive nuclear waste than all of the spent fuel pools at Fukushima Daiichi combined. So it's even more of a worry should something occur similar in in severity to what happened at Fukushima Daiichi. So we started reading about these towns in the evacuation zone around Fukushima. There are six of them that they have since determined will be ghost towns. Most likely people will never return. 160,000 refugees after the tsunami earthquake and the beginning of the meltdowns. Of those 160,000 nuclear refugees, only 27,000 people have been able to return to their homes. One of those towns is Namye. It's five miles northwest of the reactor, just like Brattleboro. They even have a literary festival every year, just like Brattleboro had. had. Uh, they had fires that they had to recuperate from. They loved parades, and they even had uh, been cataloging their grand trees, just like we do in Brattleboro. So I was really touched when I read about Namie and thought about the similarities and uh, Nancy and I started talking, and we thought, what if to commemorate this anniversary, we reach out to the towns in the evacuation zone here around Vermont Yankee and say, start reading about the town that's most similar to yours, learn about it, and then share that information with the people in your town 
So that's what we'll be doing this weekend. Unlike Namie, Itate is 24 miles northwest of Fukushima Daiichi. And like Putney, where I live, it is just outside of the official evacuation zone. So there's no sirens. Nobody has any kind of, you know, any information should something go wrong at Vermont Yankee. People lived in Atate at the time of the meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi, thinking that they were relatively safe. And a couple of days after the meltdowns occurred, they found out that the most intense plume of radioactive materials floated straight up above Atate and within the two from the two-day period through about a month after the meltdown at the meltdowns began at Fukushima, people were told they would probably have to leave home. And about a month later, Itate was evacuated. It began with 6,500 people. There's now about 120 elderly people left in the community. And like Putney, it's a beautiful village, it was considered one of Japan's 100 most beautiful villages, rural, lots of agriculture, and just it's amazing to think that 24 miles people thought they were safe and that was the last thing they were. And Namie's evacuation uh, occurred the day after the tsunami and the earthquake. Uh, Namie is five miles from the reactors. Uh, their mayor, uh, Mayor Baba, uh, was watching television and listening to the radio on March 12th and that's how he learned that his town should evacuate. Um, so he initiated the evacuation proceedings based on the word of the Prime Minister over national TV. And they went uh, to a town that usually takes about a half an hour to get to. Uh, that town, on the day they were evacuating, it took them three and a half hours 22,000 people evacuated from Namie, and there were people evacuating to this town from all over the evacuation zone. The name of the town is Tsushima. I may not be pronouncing that correctly, and I apologize to the people of Tsushima if I am not. Uh, Tsushima, come to find out, was also directly in the path of this radioactive cloud, even though it too was over 25 miles away from the reactors. What happened was around 3.30 in the afternoon on March 12th, there was what they thought was a hydrogen explosion in Fukushima number one, and that cloud came directly over the village of Tsushima. The people of Namie and the people of Tsushima did not learn that they had been in the path of this radiation until three months later. It has since been determined that the people who evacuated there and the people who were en route there received more radiation than anyone else of the evacuation. So they get to this town, they all pile into the, uh, the school and more and more people come, and it's completely overcrowded. Um, it's raining out, um, and it's, they're running out of food. So Mayor Baba went to another town, Nihomatsu, and he asked Nihomatsu if they would take in his people from Namie. Nihonmatsu had lost 2,000 homes, to the tsunami and the earthquake. However, they did open their hearts to the people of Namie. So Mayor Babe took his people and they trekked again to Nihonmatsu. It, for the next three or four months, they stayed in Nihonmatsu. Some went all over the country, but they were waiting because the national government kept saying, just a few more weeks, just a few more weeks, and you'll be able to go back home. But then the truth started to reveal itself that no, people would never be able to return 
to the town of Namye again. The levels of contamination are 500 times the international standard for safety. So now the 22,000 people of Namye are scattered in 42 different places around the country of Japan. 1,200 of them are living in a skyscraper in Tokyo. Imagine moving from Brattleboro to New York City and living on the 13th floor. Completely different. Mayor Baba has stayed in Ihamatsu and he has opened an office there and he is keeping track of the people of his town and, and we salute him for that. The people, I just wanted to say one more thing about <coughs> Itate, which is that when people, people were staying in Itate and they really did have no idea in the beginning that they were also being contaminated. They had no idea the water they were feeding the, their families, the food that they were eating, the food they were harvesting was all contaminated with radiation. And their information was absolutely not given to them in a timely fashion. And at this point right now, people are, as the people of Namie, scattered to the winds of in Japan. And there's talk right now of trying to, quote, decontaminate the village and what they're talking about is removing two inches of topsoil and people who have been interviewed, farmers and others who lived in the village of Atate feel like there's just no way with that level of contamination that removing two inches of topsoil is going to make it safe for people to live. So we, we have decided to try to publicly get these stories out and one of the things that we're doing is we've set up a, ser a group of vigils for this coming weekend to commemorate this Fukushima disaster and the Putney vigil is going to be Saturday from 1 to 3 at the sidewalk in front of the Tavern Green and we will we'll carry signs and we'll have information for people in Putney about Itate and the fate of people in Itate and hopefully just general information about the town, how it was before the disaster and how it is now. And hopefully people in Putney will come to see, as we see, that these parallels are very striking and we need to make sure that we never become the area around Fukushima. I think another, another parallel is that, um, like the United States um, and the way that the federal regulators, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the corporations that own the nuclear power plants um, are very closely tied to one another. That same situation uh, occurs in Japan. The um, Congress of Japan, the Diet, D-I-E-T, um, did an independent uh, study of what occurred around uh, March 11, 2011. And they published a 650-page report the next year. And what they concluded was that the tragedy of the Fukushima meltdowns is a man-made tragedy, not a natural disaster. What they learned was Starting in 2008, TEPCO, the corporation that owns the reactors, realized that there was a possibility of tsunami waves over 15 meters high. The defenses for the reactors could handle waves six meters high. They decided that the risk was small and the federal regulators in Japan backed them up and said, even though you have the money to build defenses for this risk that you are aware of, for these 15 meter high waves, we're not going to make you put in these safety um, defenses because it's a small risk. Well, we have seen that the inconceivable can happen. These small risks can occur, and that's exactly what happened in Japan. And in the United States at this point, there's been a series of 
studies and a series of examinations of nuclear power plants, and there are a number of risk factors that are not being strongly addressed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the industry is fighting tooth and nail any and all lessons learned regulations from the Fukushima disaster. There have anything, nothing mandatory, correct me if I'm wrong, no. nothing mandatory has gone into place for the United States nuclear power stations since the Fukushima disaster, even though there have been many, many studies with incredibly profound implications for the industry and safety in the industry, and yet we've seen no, no improvements, and we fully expect the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be completely compliant to what industry wants and have absolutely no strong recommendations or nothing. They may recommend, but nothing mandatory for the industry that might spend five cents of the industry's money that goes to their their stockholders. The one thing that we've seen happen in Japan is that right after the disaster, the response of the corporation and the government was very strong. For example, the government said, we are going to study the health implications for the children for the rest of their lives. We're going to test them for thyroid, their thyroids. Well, then what happened was the initial tests um, on the children's thyroids came back, uh, and they saw that 36% of the young children who were tested had uh, nodes growing on their thyroids, which is an early sign of the potential for thyroid cancer down the road. Um, then the government started backpedaling, and now they've decided they're going to stop uh, this mandatory testing of children. They say because it's too hard for the children to undergo these tests. Well, the same thing is similar thing has happened in the United States. Initially, right after the Fukushima disaster, um, you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the corporation said we're going to do everything that we can to make sure this never happens in the United States. But knowing that Americans have short attention spans and that as time went by, other disasters um, would come to the forefront, um, they have since backpedaled and now um, a lot of the post-Fukushima improvements that they're recommending that um, the corporations make to their reactors are just being watered down. And I just want to say one more quick thing about that, which is that one of the one of the strong recommendations that occurred after the nuclear disaster, which would have saved potential lives of Japanese people, was Gregory Yasko, who was at that time the head of the NRC, who has since been driven out has recommended a 50-mile evacuation zone around Fukushima. And, and you know, as you, two stories you've heard, these towns that were 20-something miles away from the reactor, probably people's lives would have been, their lifespans might have been lengthened if the 50-mile evacuation zone radius had been adhered to. And that was something that the United States government absolutely does not want anybody to think about because a 50-mile radius includes every city on the eastern seaboard within an evacuation zone of a nuclear power plant and many of the major cities in the other parts of the country. And I mean, it's only, there's nobody that could think about the concept of evacuating New York City, evacuating Philadelphia <laughs> evacuating Washington, Washington D.C. It's right. just inconceivable. So that was real. That was quashed pretty quickly. And two years after Fukushima, they haven't actually put any regulations into effect yet. They're still studying them and and uh, considering what post Fukushima changes should be made at nuclear reactors. So since we live so close to um, Vermont Yankee. Um, we will be representing the town of Namye, um, and we will be in Pliny Park from 11 until 1 this coming Saturday, March 9th. Um, we will have uh, handouts for everyone um, with some of the stories about the um, different evacuations of the other towns as well, as well as Namye's. We're also going to be making a card that anyone can send messages to Mayor Baba, um, who is the mayor of Namye. Uh, we're very lucky because he has an office still that we can mail that to. Um, 
There are other towns that are also representing different evacuation, evacuated ghost towns around Fukushima. In Amherst, Massachusetts, they're going to have a table at the farmer's market. Um, Wendell, Massachusetts, um, which is just 15 miles away, is going to be representing the town of Hirano, uh, which is a ghost town pretty much. Um, and in Hanover, New Hampshire, on Monday, um, they have a sister city, um, which it just so happens is the same town that Mayor Baba is now living in and that the Namye refugees went, um, the town of Nihomatsu. Um, and they'll be having their vigil on uh, Monday in front of the town hall in Hanover. In Greenfield, Massachusetts, this coming Saturday, from 2 to 4, they'll be on the town common, and they'll be representing the town of Kawawachi. And the last event we're doing related to this is in Vernon on Sunday from 11 to 1, or 11 to 12 rather, is just going to be a solemn one hour vigil commemorating the disasters at Fukushima. And do, well, the people who are doing the individual vigils for the evacuation towns will be there and we'll bring some of our um, signs and our flyers um, to further spread the word about the evacuation towns. One thing that's happened in Japan, it's there's all these unintended consequences, uh, things that I never thought about, although many times I've thought about what would happen if Vermont Yankee melted down. Well, one thing I never thought about was the impact on the freedom of the press. Uh, Japan was once known for having um, one of the best uh, media in the world, um, most transparent, um, most freedom of the press. It was in the top 15, rated top 15, just two years ago by a group called Reporters Without Borders that studies freedom of the press worldwide. This year, Reporters Without Borders ranked the Japanese media number 55. And it's all because of the amount of suppression that has gone out on the truth about what is happening in post-Fukushima Japan. The lies about radiation in the food, about the collusion between the government and the nuclear corporations and other related issues. And lies about the future health future health possibilities for people that there's there's the nuclear industry continues to say that there have been no casualties from Fukushima Daiichi and that the future outlook for people who have been exposed to the levels of radiation that they've been exposed to are just peachy and Peachy. We don't believe it for a minute, and I think most science, most educated people and scientists who are not in the pocket of the nuclear industry don't believe it either. It's one of the one of the real um, eerie things that journalists have reported when they've gone back to these evacuation towns is that they look perfectly normal. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. You can't feel it. And unlike the places that got devastated by the earthquake and tsunami, a, a lot of these areas didn't get touched. Uh, it's, it's an invisible plague on the earth, the air, and the water. Um, and the cancers often take a minimum of 10 years before they emerge. Um, and so it's a, a, a thing that's easy for the media to suppress and for governments to withhold the truth about. Yeah. And, the, and the decontamination attempts in the area are, it's, it's just incredibly impossible to consider because they want to decontaminate soil, they want to you know, take contaminated buildings, contaminated all, you know, all sorts of contaminated materials, and there's no place to put it. There's absolutely, they're talking about actually making six state parks into zones of contamination where they actually dump radioactive material. Another possibility is the areas around the nuclear power plants where those communities that are that are affected forever. But you know, immediately my thought with that was, 
great. We've got a lot of radio, highly radioactive material on the water where the Fukushima Daiichi plant is. So should there be another tsunami, what's the first thing that happens? All that radioactive material washes into the Pacific. Great idea. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very incredible conundrum that this world has gotten itself into creating the most dangerous waste product ever known to humanity. I think that a lot of uh, people ask us, well, if you're so afraid of the nuclear power plant, why do you live here? And I think that a lot of people who live here deal with that issue by you know, being in denial and not learning about these kind of horrific things that, of course, can make us all feel very sad. Yeah. Um, but one of my personal mantras has always been, Action is the antidote to despair. There's a lot of things in life can paralyze us. I mean, let's think about, I don't know, you know, the horrific things that they say about what could be in our food now, for example. Um, it it kind of makes you want to stop eating sometimes, you know? But you can't <laughs> stop eating. You got to go take care of uh, your your body and your soul. So. We can't be paralyzed, um, and we can't determine our personal life choices by some of these horrific events, um, except that what we can do is speak out. When we are moved by a particular issue, um, for me personally, this has been an issue that I felt moved to speak out about. Um, I'm very thankful to all the people out there who are speaking out about the other important issues I care about, like health care, GMOs, women's reproductive rights, history, you know, the drones, peace, there's so many issues. You've got to pick the one that really motivates you. This was the one that motivated me. And um, I, now I would go on further to say that because nuclear power has so many inherent inherent dangers for the future of the world. I mean, my, you know, I have a grandson. My grandson's grandson's grandsons will still be dealing with this waste. This is whether I live here or whether I don't live here. This is happening. And the fact that I live here gives me greater incentive to say stop, to say enough, to say we, there are better, safer, and smarter ways to be producing the power that we need to keep our life afloat in this society and you no know, I think I'd like to think that at this point no matter where I lived I would be involved in this movement but because I live here I'm able it gives me greater incentive to do the right thing speak out for the future of people on this earth and for the other creatures that we share it with